My name is Ray Fouché. I'm with the Department of History and the Program in Science and Technology Studies. And I would like to, again, thank you for coming out to the first lecture in the 2009-2010 Center for Advanced Study an, um, initiative entitled Interpreting Technoscience. 2009 and 2010, I'll be the Center for Advanced Studies resident fellow. First off, I would like to thank all our co-sponsors and, and relevant units. The Center for Advanced Study, of course, the Spurlock Museum, the Department of History, the Illinois Informatics Institute, and the iFoundry program in the School of Engineering. Let me begin by introducing Hector Postigo. Hector Postigo is an associate professor in the Department of Broadcasting, Telecommunications, and Mass Media at Temple University. He holds a PhD in Science and Technology Studies from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Um, along with that, um, to kind of brush, to speak to his, his science cred, he also has an MS in Physiology and Neurobiology, which I suppose he left some time ago. Um, he's published widely in the area of labor and digital rights movements, and specifically has written on American online volunteers, ICTs, and YouTube. Most recently, he's been working on the meaning and dynamics of video game modding. And he's in the final stages of completing a book entitled The Age of Crime Fighting Machine, The Digital Rights Movement and the Emergence of Participatory Rights. He's received external grants and funding from the National Science Foundation, the Digital Universe Foundation, and the European Union. He's on the editorial board of Games and Culture. Um, I consider Hector a, a good friend and um, a, an ex exciting and, and very engaging speaker. So he will give a lecture first, then he will we'll open it up for questions. Um, again, thank you, and I'd like to have Hector Pospigo speak for us. Thank you. Okay, so can anyone, hear, can anyone hear me okay? Am I on the microphone? Okay, so it works. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to Ray uh, and, of course, to um, the Department of History and uh, the Center for Advanced Study and also uh, the Illinois Informatics Institute for having me out. It's, uh, it's great fun to come out and, uh, and talk about uh, the stuff I love so much, which is uh, the research in video games. And of course, if some of you are here for extra credit, then how much fun to get extra credit to listen to a uh, lecture on video games. Um, so without further ado, I'm going be, I'm to begin. And I, I hate using a script, but it's going to happen occasionally. So please try to bear with me when I do that. So, so here goes. Um, many years ago, when I, was, uh, when I was still flushed with youth and blessed with the kind of acne that can only result from 99 cent cheeseburgers and 7-Eleven Slurpees, I used to play a lot of video games. Now, these are not the lonely times that you've just conjured up inside your heads. These were, in fact, very exciting times. Hours playing Pong, chasing a magnificently pixelated ball back and forth on my home's expansive 19-inch television. Back then, uh, most games had a high twitch factor, and now whether you won or lost had a lot to do with how fast you could jam, jam on that little controller's red button, giving rise to the condition known as Atari thumb. Um, I like to think of gaming back in those days as the golden age before, industry, uh, before uh, the industry was corrupted with rampant capitalism and convergent marketing. The days of Joust, the days of Space Invaders, and the days of Donkey Kong, my favorite. Nowadays, I sound like a, such an old curmudgeon, nowadays you can watch a film on the silver screen and then go home and play it, or play a part in it, on your PlayStations, PCs, Xboxes, or PS3s. Of course, the reality is that it's always been an industry, uh, and that convergence of content forms didn't happen not as a result of some sort of artistic high ground on the part of other media industries, but rather because other media industries perceived video games as the province of pimply-faced, burger-eating, sugar-drink-guzzling boys. But there was something special about video games even back then. And uh, many of us in game studies remember the questions that got us here. Uh, one question in particular, a question that sparked our imagination 
uh, as children growing up during the Cold War, at the advent of the computer age, of the personal computer age, and at the advent of the internet, I was introduced to video games by Joshua, uh, the supercomputer wreaking havoc, for the, uh, 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 wreaking havoc on the Strategic Air Command's missile control system uh, in the movie War Games. And uh, Joshua asked a simple question back then. Does anybody remember what that question was, by any chance? What is it? Shall we play a game? Right, that's the question. Sh shall we play a game? The answer, as it has turned out, is a, a resounding yes. Let's fast forward now to today, where the industry is a $20 billion a year affair, where it outsells the movie industry at the box office, and where the average gamer is uh, between 18 and 34 years old, and women are almost as likely to be gaming as men. <clears throat> we are witnessing some phenomenal games full of complexity, games of significant beauty. Some of them are set in the future, others in mystical lands, games that recount history, games that connect people via network play or massively uh, multiplayer online worlds, and games that are being used for therapeutic purposes, treating depression, helping in traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress disorder, and other uses that are, are as of yet unexplored. But then there are, of course, those games that still push on society's limits. <clears throat> Not unlike rock and roll did when it first, gy uh, when it first generated gyrations in the, and pushed heavy on the minds of pre-counterculture America. So in the age of renewed family, uh, American family values, games like Grand Theft Auto hailed for its innovative gameplay while at the same time reviled for its moral ambiguity will no doubt elicit some commentary from moral leaders and will continue to see political posturing and claims that it's all going to hell in a handbasket. But I'm here to tell you, as many other colleagues of mine in game studies would do, that even though there are some negative uh, aspects to game culture, that ultimately that there is not much to fear, and that there are some potentially important benefits to come from this new medium. It has become clear that some sectors of the game industry are providing for us the rare opportunity to contribute cultural products of our own making and design into that mixed bag that's mass media. And I'm, of course I'm talking about user-generated content. Now, the phenomenon of user-generated content began in the video game industry almost 30 years ago already. One of the earliest products was Castle Smurfenstein. Castle Smurfenstein was a parody of Silas Warner's original Castle Wolfenstein, a game written for the Apple II that involved the game's lead character trying to escape from a castle that was held by Nazi evil scientists. Um, in a According to the developers of the Smurfenstein uh, version, Castle Wolfenstein was a terribly fun and addicting game, but something was missing. Nazis just didn't seem that threatening to a suburban high school kid in the early 80s. Smurfs, that was the real threat now. So we changed the game. The Nazi guards became Smurfs. The mostly unintelligible German voices became mostly unintelligible Smurf voices. Uh, we created a new title screen, a new ending screen, new opening narration, an opening theme, and changed the setting from Germany to Canada. Apparently, that's where Smurfs live, in Canada. Excuse me. The evolution of user-generated content has, in video games, brought us a long way from those early days of Smurf smashing good fun. Uh, uh, at the apex of that progression is machinima an amalgamation of the word machine and cinema. In this novel, film genre, uh, the multiplayer network function of a game is converted to a virtual set, where one player acts as the camera, and then the other players act out all manner of drama and hijinks. Right? This turns uh, otherwise straightforward gameplay into some form of theater. One such piece involves the characters of the game World of Warcraft singing a song borrowed from the Broadway play Avenue Q. 
It's credited to the Dark Tide Guild in the world of Warcraft. Uh, and I have a short clip of it here. <coughs> so bear with me. Let's hope the sound works. The internet is really, really great. Can you raise the volume on that? Porn. I've got a fast connection, so I don't have to wait. For porn. Huh? There's always some new site. For porn. I browse all day and night. For porn. It's like I'm surfing at the speed of light. For porn. The internet is for porn. Despite what you might think, it's not. But I show this clip for a number of reasons. First, because I think it's funny. Uh, then, and most importantly, because I think it shows the various layers of convergence achieved by users. In this example, consumers have become creators. By releasing it on YouTube, TV watchers have become TV makers. Right? Uh, a play, right? a game, and a broadcast have all come together in a public performance. So it's a great example of what Henry Jenkins would call convergence culture. Games have clearly become more than they were intended to be. They have become sites of creative production for consumers. For some, environments that are game-like become homes away from home, a second life, if you will, of digitally mediated embodiment, community, economy, and even resistance. <coughs> In the online world, known as Second Life, citizens build and develop virtual real estate that they sell in the real world for real money. You guys know about Second Life a little bit? OK. So that's. Aylin Grafe, going by the avatar name An Shi Chung, for example, was the first virtual millionaire. Uh, she became a millionaire by buying virtual property wholesale, for sec for wholesale from Second Life, developing it, and then selling it online to other members of the community. She now runs a business that provides online property for multiple online worlds. Uh, on her company's website, she advertises such things as villas, complete with swimming pools and outdoor patios. Now, resisting the incursion of this most capitalist of ethics into the sanctity of the digital ether are other more subversive citizens that implement some interesting digital theater known as griefing. As the newspaper for Second Life, the Second Life Herald reported when one such attack occurred, and I quote, thousands of red Santa-capped green penises rained down on Second Life in the closing hours of Christmas Day on the grid, sending many residents into a panic to try to return the self-replicating objects before they displaced buildings, crashing Second Life entirely. Griefers have been described as spoil sports who break the magic circle of the bounded game environment. Thus, while Second Life tends to reproduce social structures of the real world, such as economy and capitalist accumulation, right? <coughs> it also creates an opportunity to decenter them, interfering with their order in often comical ways, yet at the same time drawing attention to the values embedded in all things made by human hands. It should come as no surprise, then, that there are some serious consequences to serious gaming. Globalization, knowing no bounds, has produced the phenomenon of gold farming, most notably on massively multiplayer online games, like the world of Warcraft. Excuse me. In this game, as many of you probably know, gamers go online with thousands of other players taking part in quests, participating in guilds, and feeding a virtual economy. It takes time to develop the skills and powers in the game to actually get to some of the most interesting content or own some of the most interesting weapons, like that giant green sword that that night elf has. At this, it's pretty ominous. The fact that players must continue to log in and play to gain experience helps the revenue model for the company. Right? It collects a monthly subscription fee. Gameplay during those times where players are not pursuing quests or missions and are simply hoping to get experience so that they can gain access to some of the cool content right, is often tedious and referred to as the grind. With a click of a button, a player who doesn't want to have to sit there hours on end to level up his or her character can purchase for about $800 a character that has all the advanced powers and skills 
from online vendors. It takes quite a while to generate one of these very powerful characters, hours of game play, really. To meet the demand, character dealers outsource labor to developing nations such as China, paying workers minimal sums a day. Imagine groups of people working 10-hour shifts to level up made-to-order characters. In the game world, these la laborers' avatars are seen often doing repetitive tasks uh, that accumulate gold or experience points, thus the term gold farming. Globalization, the division of labor, uh, and uh, the inequalities of network capital have found their way into virtual worlds and persist via an economy bridging real-world wor real labor practices in developing nations with virtual-world leisure practice in developed nations. It's fair to say that inside gaming networks, play has become work and vice versa. Lisa Nakamura, I think she's here today, uh, does some research on gold farming. She's found that gold farming gets mapped on, a race gets mapped onto gold farming, uh, resulting in racially problematic and actually troubling dynamics between leisure players of industrialized nations and those players perceived to be gold farmers uh, from countries like, like China. So once upon a time, I found that I had to justify my research on video games. But I find that those days are for the most part over. Uh, the military, for example, uses games in training and recruiting. Corporations have product placement inside game environments. <coughs> but I wasn't being coy when I said that I had lear I've learned to stop worrying and love my Xbox. For a lot of reasons, I see games and game culture in our society as positive. They can inspire creative, participatory content production. But I'm no slim pickings, right? Uh, you won't see me riding that Xbox down the chute. Uh, what I see is an opportunity, a small window through which those of us teaching new media studies and production can help our students enter that new era of user-generated content by teaching them m about the mores and the practices and dynamics of the interface between the user and the producer. To that end, my research for the past six years has focused on understanding the cultures of productions that have sh taken shape around PC games. Specifically, I'm studying the cultural practices and motivations that inform the production of fan-generated game add-ons known as mods. Um, I want to understand modding, as it is called, in the context of labor economies that are not primarily based on money, but on other forms of compensation like sociality, reputation, uh, fan culture, and, uh, and what a friend of mine in Australia, John Banks, calls social network markets. Uh, I think that modders and modding culture give us a unique insight into the dynamics and pitfalls of user-generated content, into the dynamics that exist between very productive audiences, very productive fans, and the companies that they contribute to. So who are modders? <coughs> well, modders are PC game fans that make modifications to their favorite PC games, right? Uh, they then release the mods online, uh, and gamers who own a copy of the game that's been modded can download it, that mod and install it. And they can then change the gameplay of, the, of their original game, either a little bit or they can change the game entirely. The number of mods for PC games are, are legion, right? Uh, <coughs> as for example, this particular site, the Mod Database, has about 5,000 mods available for various titles uh, uh, and the mods are in various states of development. So, this is just one site of many sites that has all these mods available. There are, very types of, uh, there are various types of mods that can be produced by modders, and these include uh, levels or maps, right? Uh, in this case, a modder has changed a dungeon-like environment on the left to a treehouse environment on the right, and again, you can download this for a particular game. Other types of mods include skins or tools, uh, modders can then generate new characters or new tools or weapons to use in the game. Uh, and then you have modding mods, which aren't exactly modifications, but rather are tools developed by modders to help others program or design for a particular game or game engine, like the Unreal uh, game engine or the, the Quake 3 game engine. And lastly, <coughs> we have total conversions. And these are the most ambitious mods. And they bring all the other mod types together to do a whole reworking of the original game. So in this case, we have a World War II first-person shooter called Medal of Honor. 
uh, in the PC, and it's been converted to a paintball game uh, with its own uh, soundtrack, which it's rock and roll. It's too loud for me because I'm getting old, so I didn't put it on there. But it's very, it's very good. So mod culture is a technical culture with access to its workings being mediated by command of some level of technical expertise, be that in programming or design. But it also has room for other forms of expertise, like the kind of historical knowledge that someone needs to make sense out of a mod based on a historical period, for example. Mod culture also represents, uh, reproduces itself by passing on its knowledge through tutorials posted on modding websites and continuous call for participation. Like all, um, like all online cultures engendered through computer-mediated communication, it has, the, uh, it has a propensity for um, hyper-personal relationships at the same time that it has the insensitivity of flame wars and the occasional exclusivity against newbies. But for the most part, mod cultures endure, uh, even as their composition is in flux, and even as harmony is not always the state of affairs. Now, mod culture is part of a broader participatory culture that orbits cult, uh, digital games, spe uh, especially PC games. <coughs> it's not alone. And game culture ultimately produces a whole content ecology that consists of mods, but also cheats, walkthroughs, game chatter, online, pl online play, and of course, machinima. So, hold on a second. So, for example, a given game like Battlefield 1942 can have a number of user generated content forms associated with it, right? So, it could uh, be converted, for example, from a game set in 1942 to Halo, <coughs> set in the future. And this poses an interesting dilemma for intellectual property lawyers, since it constitutes appropriation of fan, by fans of third-party content owned by Microsoft that is imported into the code of, another, of a competitor. So in other words, if you own Battlefield 1942, all you have to do is go online, download the, mod, the, uh, the Halo mod, and you get to play a Halo-like game without owning Halo. Uh, the content ecology that surrounds a given game also has cheats and walkthroughs. These are little codes that you can use in-game or little guides to how to play the game. And lastly, of course, content that surrounds any particular game includes machinima. Uh, in this case, I've shown you a machinima that's associated with a very popular game, Halo. Right? And this is red versus blue. Does anybody here know Red, red vs. Blue? Okay, so, so here's a short portion of one of the earlier episodes of Red vs. Blue. <coughs> and it's sort of uh, the, the soldier turned existential philosopher. Makes sense. Hey, yeah? You ever wonder why we're here? It's one of life's great mysteries, isn't it? Why are we here? product of some cosmic coincidence, or is it really a god watching everything, you know, with a plan for us and stuff? I don't know, man, but it keeps me up at night. What? I mean, why are we out here, in this canyon? Oh, uh, yeah. What all the stuff about God? Uh, hmm? nothing. You want to talk about it? So, um, <coughs> I mean, if you pay attention to the camera work, it's actually brilliant because they, they, they create the comedic form just by panning back and forth between. I mean, they, you have no facial expressions, right? All you hear is voices and inflection, but they're creating the tension in the film just by going back and forth. It's just, you know, br brilliant, I think. So I, I think Red versus Blue is, is important, not only because it shows a layer of convergence that I already illustrated with that clip on the World of Warcraft, but it also because it illustrates the synergies that begin to develop between game companies and productive fans. So it represents the unique intersection of commercial product and user-generated content. Uh, this series is perhaps the most popular currently in production. Uh, it's made by Rooster Teeth Productions. They actually have incorporated. Uh, it started in 2003 and continues to this day. Uh, Rooster Teeth now has its work featured on official Microsoft content 
and is commissioned by Microsoft and Bungie, the developers of, Red, uh, of uh, Halo, to produce uh, red versus blue commercials for the Halo franchise, right? So you, you can download commercials where these guys are actually selling the product. Uh, they also sell their own, uh, that's the series on DVDs, right, as well as distributing the content online. So <clears throat> a pressing question arises when one considers the extent of user-generated content the PC, uh, in the PC industry <coughs> and the increasing use of user-generated content in other industries, like, for example, television. That's also beginning. And uh, uh, internet industries, for sure. The question is, what does it all mean? I propose here that modders have been at the leading edge of participatory culture in digital media, and that recent interest in the user-generated content paradigm of YouTube, MySpace, Facebook, and all these other media industries is old hat to modders in the PC game industry. It's old news. <clears throat> so I set out to learn about mod cultures because its dynamics may answer general questions about the dynamics of user-generated content production, especially as it might apply to other industries. So I want to learn something about a small place so I can learn something about a bigger place. Right? So what does the practice of producing mods mean for modders, for gamers, for the industry? Why do modders mod, and why should we care? <coughs> Excuse me. The first thing that we can say about a user-generated content paradigm for video games and for other industries as, is that the content is valuable in an economic sense. So for example, calculations solely based on labor costs uh, suggest that PC game companies would have had to pay out between 10 and 30 million dollars to, to produce the top total conversions for the best-selling games of a few years back. Right? So a big chunk of money that they didn't have to shell out that fans did and that added to the content ecology of their existing games. The game industry acknowledges the value openly and suggests that there is more, right? When, for example, modders and fan communities serve as testing grounds for ideas that the company thought too risky to pursue, or when they generate their own ideas that the companies themselves didn't uh, have in mind. There's also value for modders. <coughs> Consistently, when asked why they mod, modders say, firstly, because it gives them a sense of contributing to community. That modding is a community-building endeavor that reward, uh, and that the rewards are social permanence, reciprocity, reputation, and participation in a gift economy. They also say they mod because it might help them land a game in the, I mean, a, a job, they probably land some games too, a job in the video game industry a belief that's supported by experiences of many modders, right? but one that also involves participating in a labor economy that's based on freelance work, so it's intrinsically unstable. Yet it remains the fact that the boundaries between mod communities and video game companies are porous, uh, a situation that's potentially changing as universities begin to professionalize game design while, because they're trying to find new revenue streams and respond to a lot of student demand. So you're going to... I think modding is one of those, it's like an apprenticeship. You can still mod and enter into a video game company without having to go to college, right, or go to a professional program, but that's changing as universities are, uh, begin to professionalize um, the field. So you're going to start seeing a lot of programs for game design or game programming. <coughs> Lastly, modders mod, and this is probably the most important point, because by contributing to, design, to the design of a game, it gives them a sense of ownership. Many modders, for example, mod a game to reference a particular historical experience or a personal experience. Through mods, modder enter the, modders enter the discourse of cultural creation, creation that is technologically constructed, visually represented, and acted out through gameplay. It's, I like to think of it as a total dramaturgical slash technological experience, right? Uh, one gets to write one's own history, and then one gets to play one's own history, right, out. So, <clears throat> the conditions for this kind of productive mutualism are often met through accidents of fate or through regulation by norms established by fans, 
and game companies long ago. So for example, uh, the game company id, right, uh, has nurtured its fan base and encouraged its content production since the days of the first person shooter, Doom. Uh, and it, it releases a host of tools to help its fans, fan base do this, like software development kits, and it gives them access to the uh, game source code. <coughs> its productive fan base and associated modding cultures have endured for now almost 15 years. And the co-productive relationship is part of the development process. In this sense, for id, no game is ever really finished. It is assumed that modders will take over, using basic building blocks of the game to take design in new directions. I would suggest that modding culture signals the end of the final product, right? A logical result of rip, mix, burn culture of the internet. But relationships between game companies and fans are not always smooth. And invariably, conflicts arise over the meaning of fan production, professional content production, whether, whether uh, it relies on user-generated content for a, for a little bit of production, for an ancillary amount, or for a large amount, is going to have to confront shifting meanings of the word and the term labor. Not so much as legally defined, although that's also a consideration, but as it comes to be defined by those who are actively involved in the co-creative process. So for example, uh, again, my friend John Banks at, at QUT in Australia uh, carried out an ethnography uh, describing the relationship between the Australian video game company Arin and fans who were incorporated into the design process for their game uh, trains. He note, uh, there's my trains, okay. So he noted that in cases of co-production, we witness a co-evolution of two economies that produce an, a social and a business economy, right? that produce a newly constituted state of social labor relations governed not, governed not only by an economic rationale, but by a cultural calculus as well. So in such a case, meaning matters as much as money, and the newly constituted relationship between business and productive fans is one that accounts for both the economic and the social. So co-creative relationships are a process by which economic outcomes sit alongside significant social and cultural outcomes uh, for the communities involved. So in his study of Oren, when the community and the developers considered each other's values, right, kept them in mind, work went well. And, and when they ignored each other's values, went, work, went, uh, work went pretty badly. Uh, creative fans became unruly, openly flaming the designers, expressing frustration on public forums, and undermining managerial control. Designers, for their part, retreated into a discourse of managerial, uh, managerialism and professionalism, right? And they constructed the community as being amateur, right? So another source of friction uh, in the model of user-generated content is the intellectual property problem. For modders and gamers, the question of whose game is this anyway has traditionally been governed by end-user license agreements and contract. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but it also, and probably more importantly, has been governed by norms or a moral economy that dictates the internal sets of rules that govern the extent of appropriation that modders can make over content. When those norms fail, they do so because of restrictive, overprotective copyright concerns, right, that in my view will limit the value and the productivity of derivative works, especially in uh, things like games. Companies let loose the discourse of law and modders retreat into the resistive design. So in one interesting case, a group of modders decided to incorporate the G.I. Joe toy line, you guys remember G.I. Joe? Part two. Into the game Battlefield 1942. So here you have a, a, you know, the G.I. Joe toy on the right, and then they're, they're, st they're putting it in, right? It's so they can play the G.I. Joe game. So this was, <coughs> excuse me, a very meaningful thing for modders and for their associated communities, communities because it referenced that, that childhood memory experience, right? And spoke to that need that I told you about, about owning the content through some sort of design, right? And referencing that personal history. So the reviewers of the beta release were enthusiastic, beginning the reviews with the taglines from the TV show, Yo, Joe, and knowing is half the battle, right? And often the chatter informed, informs was about, the mod, about how the mod was 
great because it, it brought back all these memories of their childhood. So they really loved the content. So after the game company and Hasbro threatened lawsuits for appropriating the third-party content, modders were forced to stop development, and this caused a great deal of sadness, actually. It was kind of sad to read, to read the response. The general sentiment was that everyone could have benefited from the development of this intellectual property, but everybody, everybody lost. Um, later on, another mod team decided to take up development of the G.I. Joe mod, this time with an explicit intent to ignore intellectual property right concerns. <coughs> they announced to the fan community that a cease and desist letter from the company would not stop them, and that the community's love for the content was enough to justify its production. So in this case, the community took a much, a much more confrontational uh, and resistive view. Uh, at times, referencing the broader digital rights uh, or digital copyright debate, that's been going on now for about uh, 10 years, right? They equated, for example, the G.I. Joe mod with the DSIS source code, which had been used to crack content encryption on DVDs. Uh, so in this case, the mod took on political terms. Uh, it became a symbol of a perceived right. So I would suggest that the moral economy of a mod community allowed for the discourse of ownership over content that trumped norms that had typically enforced adherence to copyright law. In that sense, this unruly workforce revolted and essentially said, because we love the content, we ought to have the right to develop it. That was their internal moral economy. Now, whether you agree with this or not, whether one agrees with this or not, is tangential to the underlying fact that user-generated content production paradigms in games or anything else will require a rethinking of how businesses conceptualize their intellectual property. If you're gonna engage the, the fan, you better be prepared. Right? You can't give someone the keys to a Ferrari and then take it back when they drive over 65, is, is really my, my point. You better, you better believe they're gonna go 100. I would argue that the breakdown in relationships between productive fans, such as modders, and game companies occur, uh, when they occur, it's like in this cartoon uh, by Doug Savage. It's a classical organizational communication problem, right? <coughs> The question then becomes, how, sh how, should we re uh, how should we organize these relationships so as to minimize conflicts and maximize the benefits to all? Uh, first, I would propose that conflicts are good if they allow for stakeholders to speak about their fears, desires, and meanings. Strategies of managerial control that would seek to instill consent of traditional work processes and managerial values within productive fans are not likely to work. Productive fans are just not bound by that discourse. They typically are working for free, and their reward systems uh, and ideologies are embedded primarily in their own communities, not in organizational structure or managerialism's values. So it bears noting that when conflicts among modders and game companies degrade into disassociation, the discourse is recognizably managerial and legalistic, right? And, locking, and that locks out fan-based notions of ownership by privileging a sacrosanct and inviolate talk of rightful copyright, right, or rightful control. <coughs> I would argue that the best way to organize user-generated content is through, the, is through an organizational co-determination model, where involvement and participation create a discursive space for the values of both the game companies and creative, uh, and creative fans. I think in new media organizations, unlike traditional organizations, co-determination might find fertile ground. So, I'm gonna leave you with a picture here from Oren's Game Trains, which was designed with a great amount of user-generated content. Because despite its troubles, I think it's a good example of, how, of the potential of user-generated content to help and inform design. <coughs> Ultimately, I offer a utopian vision of realizing effective co-production of content in digital media. If we are to learn anything from, uh, from modders and video game culture in general, it is that the creative power of the crowd is an important resource, not solely for businesses, but more importantly for us all. It gives us an opportunity to contribute via technocultures like modding, but also through our hobbies and our own knowledges into that mixed bag, right? Mass media and media entertainment. Because cultural products are wrapped up in our own phenomenological experiences, I would propose that they are part of who we are, part of our individual and collective identity, and thus there is a basis for claiming ownership over these things. If user-generated content as a paradigm for the development of mass commercial content is to succeed, a new culture of production is needed, one that recognizes the meaning of content for those that consume it 
and slash produce it because that role is, is converging, and one that lets slip the confines of singular ownership and control. Thanks. I'd like to thank Hector for the, the, the talk, and um, he'll take his questions right now for, from the audience. Um, I believe there's a, a microphone that'll be circulating for those who'd like to speak. <coughs> Not working? Yeah. How do you feel that um, customizable characters and content uh, kind of add to the, the, the self identification that a lot of people deem problematic with, with the video games, especially in terms of, of violence in general and things like that? Um, I guess it all depends on. I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to. Yeah, could you repeat the question? Sure. One? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat the question because I don't. Okay. But, um, how do you feel that the customizable characters and content? Uh huh. Um, makes things more realistic and, and kind of problematic in terms of violence and gender roles. <clears throat> well, I mean, it, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of layers to that, that question. First, you know, being able to customize a character for, for what purpose, right? So you can customize a character for, for self-expression. Uh, and so you're saying if you customize a character for the purpose of realism, to sort of affect some sort of realistic impact, right? And if you're going to do, uh, let's say, a very realistic game, where there's a lot of, let's say, violence. I mean, I, I have to re reference sort of the violence research on video games, which is, which is legion and conflicting. Uh, and so a lot of research will say, well, yeah, video games, they, you know, they, the bottom line is they tend to make people a little bit more violent. Uh, but then if you do a different type of study, if you wait a little while, people just kind of cool off and then everything's cool. So I, I guess the way I would look at sort of realism in games, if that's where you, if that's where you were going at with customizable, right? Um, in the sense that I, I'm not sure, I think the jury's still out on, on that research. It, from, a, from the aspect of how people will express themselves, the research and a lot of the work that's been done on, well, on let's say, computer-mediated communication and going back all the way back to like, uh, to mods, like multi-user dungeons, which were just simply text-based, uh, virtual environments and people, you know, would just type. Identity play has always been part of that. Uh, and so, customize it by, if you customize a character, it depends on whether you want the identity to line. It's almost like Erwin Goffman's presentation of self, right, in everyday life. What do you want to project at that, through that character, through what that character wears, through what the character looks like, right? So I think it's, it, it's an aid to the construction of self. It's an aid, perhaps, to the fragmentation, or it speaks to the, the realities of fragment itself, right? Uh, and so, I, in terms of violence, I don't know. I think the jury's still out. I think in terms of customizing a character and making it look like something you want it to look like, I think it helps people articulate things uh, about themselves that, uh, that we do anyway by the clothes we wear. Um, so. What are the impacts on modding communities as games such as Little Big Planet or City of Heroes start putting into the game itself the means of creating and publishing and accessing all right. from within these mods? I mean, I think it's, it's, the, it's the natural, uh, not natural, nothing's, it's the, the logical progression of the, of the, of the system, right? That, um, the, the, some company, like vi video game companies above all, have just woke up one day and said, oh my God, right? All these people are making all this stuff. And it's, you know, and so it's, it's the idea of trying to tap this, the crowd. Mod, mod communities, I think, are different, categorically different than communities that will probably take up around things like Little Big Planet, mostly because mod communities are, there's always a, almost always a programmer. So there's like, it's a very technological community as well. Not to say that there isn't other. So they're, they're, they're in composition, they're different. 
I don't think that there'll be anything, they won't be like sort of go out of, you know, go out of style or anything. People will continue to do it because it's embedded in a t tinkering culture. And I think if anything, things like Little Big Planet are attempts to bring tinkering culture from the confines of the PC game industry, which in comparison to consoles, is a small fraction of the larger uh, industry. Uh, it's, it's an attempt to bring that kind of culture out of that spot, space into sort of all of us, right? The majority of people who own a PlayStation 3 or an Xbox. And Xbox, for example, is the, releasing, um, you can develop little games now, right? They've, the, you can access, uh, you can get a license for developing small games and then distribute them. So I think these game companies are trying to figure out that there's, there's, there's something to, ha to be had there. My concern is that there's got to be a synergy in which uh, the co-production, the co-production aspect of it should be tapped, such such that people can have a voice if they're able, right, uh, to create these interesting and new. Uh, and and I, admittedly, they all won't be good. Some people will say and create abhorrent things, but that's the price we bear, right, uh, for free speech. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, how do you feel about um, companies like Valve who release their source code and, um, and other tools and encourage modification and then once you know, quality mods come out, they actually purchase the rights back and kind of work with the team? Uh, yeah. Is this a model that other companies should pursue? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, there's an, I mean, yeah, video game companies are, are pretty much acknowledging this and Valve, is a, is a, Valve and id are probably the two sort of uh, companies that have pretty much pushed that out. As, as far, you know, they're at the leading edge. Uh, I think it's a good thing for, for the modders. I think it encourages them. If you look at actually, the reality is that very few mods, be, you know, like everybody thinks Counter-Strike, right? Which was a mod to the game, um, it's a Half-Life, right? Uh, which is a wildly popular game. And then the mod ha uh, Counter-Strike becomes more popular than the actual game. Valve comes, taps the development group, and then they have this monster game. Uh, that's actually few and far between. So when I was talking about like, you know, they entered the mod community because they think they're going to land a job or something like this will happen, the reality is that most of them won't, right? The, the reality is that the mods will be okay and people will play them and the, the reward will be within the context of the small community. The, re the benefit to the, to, the, to the industry as a whole will be that, wow, you know, if you get bored playing one game, you can always go and scroll, screw around and see, oh, I found this other thing and you mod, right? So there's this, there's this moment of sort of synergy but the majority of them don't really make that transition. And I guess what I'm arguing is, is, is that maybe there should be much more of that cross, uh, or even cross-pollination, if you want to use the biological term, right, uh, of coming together and speaking to each other and actually maybe engaging in co-development projects with specific uh, mod companies. But, but that's, a, that's an, I think, an emergent model. Does that make sense? And I, so I think it's a good thing. I think it's going in the right direction. There's always an issue of equity. Because intellectual property is always um, the underlying kind of common denominator. Because ultimately, you know, I have conversations with lawyers about this, and they're like, well, if they really just wanted to, they could just, you know, sue them, and that's it. You know, it's technically, it's, you know, it's the game company's intellectual property. But then other lawyers will say, no, well, it's a derivative work, and it's more complicated than that. So all that needs to be hashed out. I'm always curious how my voice will sound through these things. But um, nevertheless, um, can you speak of the political economic elements of modding community? Because I know you talked about gold farming, and I think that's something significantly different than mm -hmm. modders um, community in general. <laughs> right. So the whole political economy of mods and then the increasing talk of the political economy of user-generated content. So political economy meaning who owns the means of production, right? Uh, and then what does that mean? If you own those, the means of production, does that give you power? All right, so in a sense, modders are always, it, the, the theory has always focused on this idea of free labor, right? And the idea is that in post-industrial societies where everything we do can become part of that wonderful capitalistic sphere, right? Where twittering, the act of twittering, for example, or the act of posting something to Facebook, right? How many here on Facebook? Okay, welcome to you. You've just added thousands of dollars of revenue to that company simply by inhabiting its space, right? So that political economy, it says, the theory always says, well, 
we're more or less complicit in sort of the broader capitalist project, right? Because by simply being ourselves, right, we too have become laborers. We are the social factory. Uh, and so that, that's the political, the same, kind of, the same kind of discourse surrounds theories of political economy. In, the, in, the, in sort of the theoretical f circles that I'm in, that discourse has become increasingly problematic. Because the more you talk to modders, the more you talk to people involved in these productive endeavors, the more you realize that they don't care. They know that the company's making money. And to continue to patronize them and telling them, telling them you are now a subject to false consciousness is, well, a problem, right? So, so, what you, <laughs> right? so what you need to do is kind of think of a new way of looking at, that's why I talk about the phenomenological, the personal experience, the historical experience, because that's what matters. It gives people another system of rewards. And that's why you know, I, I kind of harken back to like organizational calm, right? Where, where you know, Stanley Dietz is, is there saying, telling people, you, know, don't, you, know, you can't control the way, you, know, you have to create a discursive space for everybody's values. Because I think that, that in a, from a pure sort of org comp perspective, gives space to the values, and values, oh God, the values, right? How redundant. Uh, because I think that's where the political economy theory needs to go. It needs to go to a, a different spot. We just don't have the language for it yet, I think. Or oh, we're working on it. John, John Bank, Banks in Australia and, and Sal Humphreys, a couple of people down there are really doing some great work on that. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, it's about modding at this moment in time. Um, you kind of use the language of tinkering, which you know, that has that very traditional history of technology kind of mm -hmm. um, aspect to it. And modifications to machines or technological objects is not new. I mean, <laughs> um, you talk about video game modding, the, right. you know, people mod their automobiles, they jailbreak their iPhone. Um, there's multiple different ways that people mod. So can you talk a little about what, what do you think is really special about this specific moment in time in relation to other forms of um, technological modification? Mass media. Mass media. So for example, if you were part of a community that modded a car, let's say, or modded, or, you know, these communities were locked in to their, it, it really for me, if I were to create, if I were to speak to the one distinguishing characteristic, I would say that because they can put the stuff online, and millions of people can download it, it creates, it's, it's, it's mass communication, right? Uh, which is different than saying we have a, a zine that 50 people have on this particular tinkering culture, right? Or maybe 100 people. That the fact that you can, that this can become a mass produced, a mass consumed, totally changes, it, it's a categorically different experience, uh, which opens up a whole new set of issues for these folks that other people didn't have, right? First and foremost, intellectual property issues, right? Uh, normative issues. Now well, how should we regulate this, our community so as to regulate perhaps the boundaries to the outer world, right? So I, that would be the, my answer. <coughs> well, um, I guess, um, your answer to Ray's question kind of um, answered my, the question I had, but um, um, I guess when you are talking about user-generated content, mm -hmm. um, there's, I guess, on the one hand, um, places like um, YouTube, where you can share um, whatever you created. And on the other hand, um, there are um, places like um, mod download websites mm -hmm. or um, uh, official websites of the um, game makers that let you share your mods or machinima or whatsoever. But I, um, I, I guess I um, was curious about was um, possible relationship between those two places sharing um, user generated content. Um, so I was just curious if you see anything like, um, you know, someone creates this mod, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, someone downloads that mod, do something in that mod, and post that video to YouTube, 
and because of that YouTube video, this mod becomes hugely, massively popular. Oh. That, 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 that kind of um, yeah, I, you know, I, yeah, that's a good point. I you know, actually have never looked at that relationship. I don't even know if that happens, if people, for example, do machinima with mods, right? So for ex I don't know. That's a good question. Um, there is probably a relationship, I can only imagine, but it would make, you know, to put on my sort of like, I don't know, but let me talk about it anyway hat. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is the I would imagine that it's the it's another step in sort of the logical progression, right? Users are going to do these creative things, um, and they're they've probably already done it. And I don't I don't know what to think other than it creates another node in that network of user generated content, and probably adds to the mix of trying to figure it out. <laughs> Good question. 